Acts chapter 15. Um, as you know, many of you know, because, you know, you've heard me talk about it. The Lord just forbids me, at least for right now, to speak with notes through the book of Acts. I love notes. I preach with five or seven pages of notes. And the Lord just keeps saying, not right now, not for this season. You're going to follow my spirit. So I don't know what all is going to uh, await us in chapter 15. Now, to my knowledge, this is the first time in 14 chapters that we're going to cover an entire chapter in one Sunday. Uh, we typically spend anywhere from two to four weeks per chapter is what we have been doing. And so I think this is the 37, maybe 38th sermon in our series of Acts so far. And uh, so, but I'm excited about what the Lord's going to speak to us. How many of you have ever been a part of a church that went into an all out either dispute or fight or brawl or split or argument. How many of you have been? A, you've ever been a part of a church that went through that? Oh, look how many hands! So first of all, you know firsthand what we're talking about. Then, right? You know the hurt when a church family disagrees. You know the hurt when pastors fight or there's a power struggle. You have ever been in a church where there's a power struggle? Oh, Lord, help us! And so you know firsthand what I'm talking about. Now, one of the great models to me in, in pastoral ministry was W.A. Criswell. Anyone ever listened to W.A. Criswell when he was alive? Yes, some of you have. Pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas. Now, Pastor Bob and I were in Dallas some years ago for a pastor's conference there. And, uh, you know, we went looking around Dallas and exploring. But I said, one thing I've got to do, I've got to go to First Baptist. And all we did was walk in and look around for a minute. But it was special to me. And the reason why is because W.A. Criswell pastored his church, I think it was over 40 years. 40 years. And the church never split under his ministry. There was one season of great conflict that came into the church. And the church almost split. And do you know what W.A. W. A. Criswell did? Fascinating. He hired a construction company to come in. You know, it's a massive auditorium. And they, you know, have the old school pews. And hired a construction company to come in and build kneeling benches along the back of every single pew in the auditorium. The church gathered that Sunday and tensions are high and conflict. And, you know, everyone's wondering, is the church going to split? And you know what he does? He cancels the choir. He cancels the sermon. He cancels the entire program of the day. And he said, if you're part of this church, get on your knees. We're going to pray. And they pray. Prayed the whole service and the church never split. Amen. What a great model for us. So, you know, there are times in church life, Satan is going to find a foothold. There are times, and some of you will understand what I'm saying. There are times that you'll feel weird in church. There are times that you'll, you'll, you'll feel odd and you won't even know what's going on. You'll think, well, what's wrong with me? I love this place. I love church, but I don't feel right. I, I've always loved being here, but something don't feel right. There are seasons. There are times like that, that, that those things happen. And, you know, I read chapter 15. We're going to read it in a second. And, and I read chapter 15, and I think, what a far cry this is from Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, they had all things in common. Acts chapter 2, they're selling, you know, they're selling all their goods and giving it to the poor. They're supporting one another. They're in perfect harmony, perfect unity, gathering in one another's homes, fellowshipping every day. The Lord's adding to the church daily as such should be saved. I mean, it is Christian utopia. And now what's happened to the church? You know what's happened? Satan has had time to work. He's found footholds. We saw a little bit of this cracking with Peter. Remember when Peter went in chapter 10 and preached to the Gentiles at Cornelius? And then when he gets back to Jerusalem, there are brothers who didn't disagree with him. The Bible says, Luke records, they criticized him. And so the boat began to rock a little bit. Now, Paul and Barnabas has been commissioned from the Antioch church. They've went all over the Gentile world. They've completed, we did that last week, they've completed their first missionary journey. God gave them enormous success. Now there's churches planted all over the Gentile world of Asia Minor. 
And now there's going to be a problem. Because how many of you know when God begins to move and God begins to work, is Satan not right there working too? Is he not right there opposing and hindering and trying to block and trying to stop? Have you not found that true in your own life? Satan tries to oppose, doesn't he? And watch what happens. Chapter 15, verse number 1. Our topic today is controversy in the church. How do churches handle disputes and how do friends handle disputes. We're going to see it. Acts chapter 15, verse 1. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers. Now listen to this. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses. Now here's the whole problem. You cannot be saved. Note that. So when we talk about the controversy of Acts chapter 15... The controversy really is not circumcision. That's not really, uh, that's not really the main controversy. Here's the controversy. And you say, Chad, well, how do you say that? Because in a moment when they send the brothers, we're going to read this. When they send a letter to the brothers of Antioch, to the Gentile world, James, the brother of Jesus, who does this letter, isn't even going to mention circumcision. Circumcision is not really the main topic of this. Here's the main topic. They're teaching the brothers, unless you're circumcised according to the customs of Moses, here's the key phrase, you cannot be saved. I don't know why, but throughout human history, we as human beings feel a need to add to our salvation. It's hard for us to accept salvation by grace Through faith, that's difficult for us to do. It's hard for us to say there's nothing we can do on our own to merit God's grace and His wonderful gift of salvation. We think we have to add to it. And there are so many denominations today, there are so many different religions today, that they go, well, salvation is God's grace plus this. And that's a false gospel. And what the problem of Acts 15 is, is that these people are teaching these brand new saved Gentiles, unless you add to your work of salvation, unless you do this, unless this is something you check off in the to-do list, then you are not truly saved. And be assured, people do the same thing today. may not be circumcision, but let me tell you, there's many, many who believe in good works, and they believe you must do this, and you must do that, and you must accomplish this. Salvation is not God's grace plus whatever you do. Salvation is God's grace, period. And what the whole point of Acts 15 is, is to settle once and for all, both Jews and Gentiles, all men everywhere, every continent, every language, every generation, we are saved one way, and that is through the grace of Jesus Christ. So if you're someone that you constantly doubt your salvation, if you're someone that you constantly wonder, have I truly been saved? Have I done it the right way? If I died right now, would I go? And you just wrestle and you struggle and you don't know if you have done it right. I can't tell you how many people in my pastoral ministry have come to me and said, Pastor Chad, I don't know if I'm saved. I've prayed, but I don't feel saved and I don't know. And I'll say, well, tell me a little bit about your experience. And and, and it never fails. They'll say, well, I did this and I prayed this and it was here and I followed this and I read this. And and, and so often I'll stop them and I'll say, brother, brother, sister, listen. Listen to what you're saying. I, 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 I. Salvation is not what we do. Salvation is what God has done in our life. Amen? Because even the faith we have is a gift from God. God gives every man a measure of faith. Even the faith we have is a gift from God. So this settles it. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9. Salvation is a gift of God, not of man, lest any man should boast. It's a gift of God. So this is the dispute. This is the problem. People have come down from Judea. They're teaching the brothers, unless you're circumcised, according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Verse 2. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the brothers were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about the question. And being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and 
and Samaria, describing in detail uh, the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, Oh, you've seen those cliques in church, haven't you? You've seen those cliques that belong to the party of the Pharisees? You ever seen those cliques? They're the ones that judge people. They're the ones who always watch what others are wearing. They're the ones who gossip a lot. You know what I'm talking about, right? Say amen if you know what I'm talking about. You're making me uncomfortable. Bunch of judgy Christians. You're judging me. I can feel it. The party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary. Whoa, we got a problem. It is necessary. See, this is where the dispute is. It is necessary, these Pharisees said, to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. I can hear them now. These traditionalists. See, traditions aren't wrong. You understand that, right? The church should hold to many great and deep traditions. Traditionalism is legalism. And that's wrong. Church should not be traditionalism. That's where you get into legalistic matters. That's where you worship. Well, this is how, this is how we've always done it. This is how it ought to be because this is how it's always been. Tradition's not wrong. T traditionalism is wrong. That's legalism. And so these Pharisees are saying, whoa, 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 Paul, Paul, whoa, whoa, Barnabas. You're out here preaching the gospel to all these Gentiles. Well, let me tell you guys something. They better be circumcised and they better follow the law of Moses because if not, they're not truly saved. <laughs> I was about... 15 or 16, I was 16, when I started working at Anchor Bookshop. Anybody remember Anchor Christian Bookstore that used to be off of Stone Drive? They gave me a job when I was a teenager. And, you know, I didn't know nothing. I just loved God and loved books and knew I wanted to preach one day. And, and I didn't know big doctrine or nothing like that. And I had been a part of this big evangelistic thing. It wasn't mine. I was a kid. But I was a part of it. And there was a lot of people that got saved. And uh, I'm standing in this bookstore on shift telling this guy that all these people had gotten saved. They'd given their lives to Jesus. And he said, well, let me ask you a question, young man. He said, were those men filled with the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues? Well, I don't, I don't know. He said, well, if not, they didn't get saved. Well, the other guy standing, I don't know, he was eavesdropping. I don't know what he was doing. But he was listening in on the conversation and he butted in and he said, well, let me tell you this. If they weren't baptized in Jesus name, they're not saved. He said, all these people you said to get saved, did they get baptized on the spot? I, 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 I'm, I don't know. <laughs> so then these two started arguing with each other. Christians are crazy. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, you got some that they are just crack pots, right? Something's fell loose. Something's not right. I mean, and they'll argue. Have you ever met those Christians? They would argue with a the wall. They'll beat their head against the wall. Just enjoy the noise. And that's who these Pharisees were. This was a, these were Pharisees who had become believers. And they said, whoa, Paul, Barnabas, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're talking. No, no, no. These people aren't saved because they haven't, they've not added nothing to their salvation. They didn't understand grace. So, you can see what a mess we're in. And it's the same today, isn't it? You go to some church, they'll tell you, hang on. You go to another church, they'll tell you, let go. Well, which is it? Some churches will tell you, you got to be filled. Some churches tell you, you got to be empty. Well, which is it? Churches will tell you everything, won't they? Stick to what the Bible says. Amen. Don't listen to all that mess. Anyways, that's not even part of our sermon. All right. It, where, where am I now? Verse um, 6. Oh, we got a long way to go, Lord. All right. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider the matter. And after there had been much debate... Peter stood up. Now, watch this. 
First of all, how do you handle disputes? Well, let me tell you what you don't do, and this is what the early church did not do. You don't sweep things under the rug. When there's a dispute in the church, you talk about it. You handle it. You tackle it head on. Amen? Have you ever been around those leaders that they just sweep things underneath the rug? That doesn't work, does it? No, when there's dissension, when there's conflict, when there's tension, let me tell you, the best thing to do is gather around the table and put everything on the table. Right? Because let me tell you what I've learned through all of my years of past. I've pastored for 17 years now. And let me tell you what I've learned in that 17 years. Now, there are some people you can't tell them anything. Have you ever, you know, you met those people, right? You're not going to tell them anything. They're going to learn the hard way. They're going to be hard learners. And they're going to have to learn the hard way. And you say, God bless you. Amen. <laughs> Warren Wearsby used to say, To live above with saints I love, oh, it will be glory. To live below with saints I know, well, that's another story. <laughs> And there's some people, they're hard learners, and you're not going to tell them anything, and that's, you know, that's how it is. But let me tell you what I have learned. When people love the church, they love the Lord. There isn't anything you can't fix. There isn't anything that you can't work out. You may have to agree to disagree, but that's just fine. You agree to disagree, and you love one another, and you move on in Jesus' name. Amen? When you, take, when you take brothers who they don't have their own agenda, see, it's those people you can't handle. When people have their own agenda and they have in their head, this is what I'm doing. Unfortunately, we're going to see that with Barnabas in a moment. He, he made up his mind. There was no talking to Barnabas in this situation. So when brothers have made up their mind and there's nothing, well, there's nothing you can do. Pray for them and go on and try to maintain peace. See, that's why Paul wrote in Ephesians, we have to be eager to maintain the bond of peace. I can't tell you how I felt the first time I read that and realized what it said. I'm like, Lord, this stuff isn't built in. God's like, no, it's not built in. You have to be eager to maintain peace. You know what that means? You've got to work at it sometimes. You'll get sideways sometimes. Your attitude will get bad sometimes. Anybody ever get a bad attitude? Hey, amen. We get bad attitudes. We get sideways. We get offended. We get our feelings hurt. All of this stuff. You know why? Because we're human. And it happens to every single one of us. But how do you overcome it? You take your little agenda. That's not glorifying God. You take your little agenda and you set it aside and you say, I want to glorify God more than I want to be right. I want to glorify God more than I want to prove my point. I want to glorify God more than I want to feel good. I want to glorify God. And let me tell you, when you come to the table with that kind of attitude, anything can be reconciled. Anything can be worked out. Anything can be agreed upon. Amen? That's why Paul wrote so extensively, we have to humble ourselves. If Bob and I sharply disagree, and my number one goal is to get him to agree with me, we're not going to go very far, are we? But if my number one goal is to be humble, and I say, no, Lord, no, Lord, it's about the glory of God. It's not about my ideas. Well, guess what? And if that's Bob's heart, and I know it is, where are we going to end up? We're going to end up on the path that glorifies God. Amen? That's how the church ought to operate. So here they are. It's just, oh, it's a mess. It's an absolute mess. So Peter, now now remember what we said. Chapter 10, uh, Peter preaches to the Gentiles. God told Peter, Jesus said, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. And what did that mean? Well, Peter took the keys and unlocked the kingdom for the Jews in Acts chapter 2. Peter took the keys of the kingdom, unlocked the message of salvation for the Samaritans in Acts chapter 4. And then in Acts chapter 10, he took the keys of the kingdom and unlocked the door of salvation to all of the Gentile world. And God has used Peter. And then we saw in chapter 12, he's arrested by King Herod. They try to kill him. God miraculously releases him from jail. He goes to a prayer meeting. And from that prayer meeting, Luke says he went away. And we don't hear from him again until the Jerusalem council. And now here we are in the Jerusalem council. And this is the last time, the last time we'll hear from Peter 
in the book of Acts. He'll go on to write 1 Peter and 2 Peter. He'll go on to die a martyr's death. He'll be crucified upside down. But this will be the last time we see him in the book of Acts. So Peter stands up. <clears throat> Goodness. Verse number 7. And said to them, brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you. That by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God who knows the heart bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them. I bet that riled the feathers of the Pharisees. Having cleansed their hearts by faith. Not by customs, not by rituals, not by circumcision, not by the law of Moses. It's done by faith. Verse number 10. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? Let me translate this. He's saying, you've not kept the law. Our fathers hadn't kept the law. We can't keep the law. Now, why are you putting unrealistic expectations on these new disciples? It's a yoke. Wow. You're getting down to business now. In verse 11. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. Just as they will. Oh my goodness. I had a. I had a guy get sideways with me on Facebook. Don't you hate it when people... Don't you hate those keyboard warriors? I mean, they'll just say anything they want on a keyboard. Isn't that ridiculous? And, you know, we have this app, Awaken to Grace, and it's reaching so many people. And we have a website, Awaken to Grace, and now there's a Facebook page called Awaken to Grace. Well, this guy gets on the Awaken to Grace page. You can read it. You can go to Awaken to Grace and read the comments. I think it's under discussion, I think. Well, this guy just loads both barrels against me. You're preaching a false gospel. You're preaching, you're preaching grace. God doesn't save through grace. God saves through the law of Moses. Well, I wasn't going to argue with the guy. I just said, I, I think the Bible would disagree with you. Well, you're reading the wrong Bible. You know, it's like, whoa. I'm thinking if I wanted to get yelled at, I would have stayed at home, right? I'm kidding. That's a joke. <laughs> She's in Rock Alley. It's fine. Unless one of you tell her. And if one of you tell her, don't tell her. Don't tell her. <laughs> But listen carefully what Peter says. Now see this guy, this guy who got all upset because we preach grace. No, listen what Peter says. Listen, it's crystal clear. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. There's no distinction now. The gospel is for the world. Amen. The gospel is for the world. Now, verse 12, and all the assembly fell silent and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, now listen, this is James. This is the brother of Jesus. James has assumed a leadership in Jerusalem. Peter was the leader and now James is the leader. We assume because Peter has been in hiding for quite some time after Acts chapter 12. And now James, the brother of the, the physical brother of Christ, he is now the leader. You know, James, they nicknamed him Camel Knees because church history tells us he was nicknamed Camel Knees because he spent so much time on his knees in prayer. Isn't that something? Now listen to what James says. James replied, brothers... Listen to me. Now listen, they didn't sweep things under the rug. They tackled it. They tackled it. They, they didn't say, well, this, uh, this group of people is upset, but we're not going to worry about it. We're just going to let them stay upset. No, they handled the issues. And let me just be crystal clear with you. There are going to be issues we have to handle as a church. There are going to be disagreements. And there's going to be disputes. And there's going to be people think this and people think that. And we let the Word of God handle all this. And we go back to what does the Word of God say? What does it teach? And whatever it says, that's what we're going to go with, right? And this is how they handled it. So James says, brothers, 
Listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited, visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree just as is written. Now he's going to quote the book of Amos. All right. And trust me, these Pharisees knew the Old Testament. They knew that the book of Amos. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. So what he's saying is, Paul isn't making this up. Barnabas isn't making this up. Simeon's not making this up. Peter's not making it up. God says that he's going to call Gentiles by his own name. We're living in this time. Verse 19, therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogue. So what, what's he saying? James is saying, listen, we still have to have a path where we coexist. And let's don't be a stumbling block. Let's say, look, circumcision is not necessary for salvation. There isn't anything necessary. Salvation is by grace through faith. But here's what we are going to do. We're going to help you coexist. So according to what the law teaches, abstain from these four things. And then there'll be unity. You know, Paul gives the same commandment. Paul later writes that, you know, it's not unlawful to eat, you know, meat with blood in it, things like this. You know, the customs change. But this is what Paul does say. Don't do anything that's a stumbling block to your brother. Don't do anything that's a stumbling block. Don't do anything that is a stumbling block to your brother. Now, you know, I'm not going to jump on no soapbox or nothing like that. But, uh, you know, people ask me a lot. They say, you know, Chad, is it wrong for me to drink alcohol? Biblically speaking, I wouldn't say it's wrong for you to drink. I wouldn't say, I, I, I wouldn't look at the Bible and say the Bible says that for you to completely abstain from any type of alcoholic beverage in any form. But for me, culturally, I can't do that. If my wife and I went to Olive Garden and we simply had a glass of wine with our meal. What would people walk out saying? They would say, I saw that pastor of that church in downtown and he was drinking. Now, in other parts of the world and other parts of the country, it's not that big of a deal. But where you and I live in weird East Tennessee. It's a big deal. Right. So for me, I've chosen I'm not going to be a stumbling block. I'm just not going to do it. I counseled a man in my office one day who was a lifelong alcoholic. And I said, how did you become an alcoholic? And I'll never forget what he told me. He said, I was about 16 or 17 and I went to a wedding and the pastor was with the bridal party and he was drinking with them. But probably with champagne. I don't know what it was. But no matter what it was, the man said, I saw then, if the preacher can do it, then I can do it. And he became a, life, a lifelong alcoholic. Now, should we be legalistic? No. If it's not your conviction, should we take great old big boulder stones and stone you for it? No. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying, for me, for me, I can't do that and it be culturally right to our culture. It would be a stumbling block. You understand what I'm saying? Glenn was at Chili's one day and uh, he was telling me there was a, a student who began coming and they were really investing in this young lady and really pouring into her. And all of a sudden a man walks up to his table and says, hey, he said, you're the youth pastor at Preaching Christ, right? And Glenn said, yeah. And he said, well, my daughter has started going and what a change it's made in her. Thank you so much for everything you're doing. Amen? And what if Glenn had been sitting there with a big old tall glass of whatever? You think that man would have had as much confidence in him? No way. Is it, biblically, is it wrong? That's not my question. I'm asking, 
Does it glorify God? Is it right in the sense of, does it glorify God? Is it wise? Is it the wise thing to do? So again, that's just one example of saying, listen, not that we're legalistic, not that you have to do this in order to be saved, but listen, this would help your testimony. This would help you. You see what I'm saying? And that's what this letter is. The letter is saying, listen, brothers, just abstain from this. And if you abstain from these things, you're going to have good unity with all these Jews that's in every single city where the law of Moses is read. You're going to keep good unity. You're going to be a good testimony. And we're going to go forward in Jesus' name. Do you see the spirit of this letter? Not bringing the hammer down. It's saying, listen, brothers, let's, let's do what's wise. Now, verse number 22. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas called Barabbas and Silas, leading men among the brothers with the following letter. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and uh, Cilicia, greetings, since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words. Unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions. <laughs> In other words, they're lone rangers. They've gone rogue. They didn't go with our authority. Verse 25. It has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barabbas and Paul. I'm sorry, Barnabas and Paul. Men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who, them, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements. That you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. Not a great letter. Verse 30, so when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they went, they, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. Now watch this. Now we're getting ready to transition. There's a disagreement doctrinally. They handled it. They tackled it. They addressed it. They put all the cards on the table. They said, what glorifies God? What do we believe? What are we going to decide going forward? And they went forward together in unity. In unity. I can thankfully say that since we've had elder team, deacon team, financial team, I have not made one decision for this church as a Lone Ranger. Everything that we've decided has been team decisions. Everything. The church is not designed to be ran by one man. Would you agree? It's designed to have plurality of leaders. And why? Because there's safety in that. So even though these Pharisees were sideways, and even though these Pharisees were, you know... You know, they were legalistic. No, the leadership of the church moved it forward. And that's how it ought to be ran. But now, what do you do when you disagree personally? Oh, now this is when it hurts. But let's read and let's watch what happens to Paul and Barnabas. And then we'll begin to close. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. So everything's going good, right? They're continuing their ministry. They're fulfilling what God has called them to do. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, so we don't know how long this was. We don't know if they remained months, a couple of years. We don't know. Luke just says after some days. He says to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. But Paul thought it best not to take them, take with them the one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia. You remember that on the first missionary journey. 
John Mark turned around and went home. He deserted them and apparently ticked Paul off. Had not gone with them to the work, verse number 39. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they departed from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. This is a very unfortunate circumstance. One day when I get to heaven, I would love, love, love to get the full story on this. Paul and Barnabas have a sharp disagreement. I mean, we're talking about men who are as godly as godly can get. I mean, men who the Holy Spirit hand chose in Acts chapter 13. And after prayer and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart Paul and Barnabas to a work with which I've called them to do. And now they're split. And now they're mad. I mean, notice the language. A sharp disagreement. Has anyone ever cut you with their tongue? Have you ever cut someone with your tongue? You know what sharp disagreements are, right? Boy, we can misuse it, can't we? And they've had a sharp disagreement over a young man named John Mark. Now, John Mark deserted them in Pamphylia, left on the first missionary journey. I'm sure all Paul could see was the back of John Mark as he deserted them. A few lessons I want to bring out here. What do you do when you disagree personally? See, it hurts more than doctrinal disagreements, right? You can agree to disagree over doctrinal things. And, you know, you keep, you keep the grace of God, number one. You keep the word of God, number one. You'll go on. You'll move on. You'll, you'll get past it. But what do you do when it's personal? What do you do when it hurts, right? How do you handle it? Well, what we know, just so I don't leave you on the edge of the cliff, Paul and Barnabas and John Mark, they all did reconcile. Paul later wrote in Timothy, commending Barnabas, and uh, they reconciled their relationship. And he also invited John Mark to come see him when he was in prison in Rome in his last days. He wanted to share his last days with John Mark. John Mark went on to become a hero of the church. As a matter of fact, this is the same John Mark that penned the gospel of Mark. The same man. God went on to use him. But there was great damage done in the process. Now, I've thought about this all week. And I've, I, can't, I, can't, I just kept going back. How should this have been handled? Was it handled best? Was it handled right? Now, see, God in his sovereignty, he did allow this. And you know what happened? They covered double the ground. And that happens sometimes. I mean, God in his sovereignty, he can cause all things, the good, the bad, the ugly. He can cause all things to work together for good. Can he not? I'm thinking of two churches right now. I would never say their names out loud. But the pastor left and the church split and half the people went with him and the other half stayed at the other church. And for a long time, I'm talking probably a good year, boy, they bickered back and forth. I mean, they would talk bad about one another and all this mess. And it just hurt. They weren't doing it because they were bad people. They did it because they were hurt. It hurt deeply. And this pastor that had left... I worked, uh, I worked at a jewelry store at that time, and he called me at work. He called me at work, and, and we had just started this church. I mean, we were maybe just a couple of months old or whatever, or just starting. Maybe we hadn't even started yet. And he called me, and he said, hey, Chad, he said, I just want to ask you a very direct question. He said, do you have a problem with me? <laughs> well, that will put you on the spot. And I said, brother, I don't have a problem with you, but I do have a problem with the way you've done things. You're not thinking right. You're not glorifying God in the way you're doing things. I don't doubt that God didn't tell you to plant a church, but I doubt God's told you to do it the way you're doing it. And that was very hard to say because, man, I looked up to this man. Very, very hard to say. Well, God brought grace and a lot of time has passed now. A lot of time. And they've reconciled. And I've had the joy of preaching in both churches. I told both churches, I said, who's, who's going to be saved under your minute? Who's going to join a family when all the kids do are fight? 
Right? You got to keep the glory of God number one. But thankfully, over time, things restored and God brought grace and things are better. And, but listen, things like this happen. But you know what? God in his sovereignty can duck, cover double the ground. Now there's two great churches, not just one. But the collateral damage in the process, oh, the monumental. It was heartbreaking. So I wonder, you know, I've wondered how should this have happened? How should it have been handled? Well, let me show you a couple of things and then I'll, I'll bring it to a close. Was Barnabas right or was he wrong? Well, I'm going to argue that I think Barnabas was wrong. I think he was wrong in the way he handled this. Let me show you why. Verse number 36. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now, Barnabas wanted to take with him John Mark. But Paul thought it not best. Barnabas had already made up his mind. He was going to take John Mark. They were cousins. They were related. And this was going to happen. He approaches Paul and says, well, Paul, what do you think about this? I think he's matured. I think he can do it. I think he can handle it. Let's take him. And Paul says, no, no, he's done burned me once. Uh, uh-uh. We're not taking him. And all of a sudden, this sharp disagreement comes. Now, how should Barnabas have handled this? Should Barnabas now, you, you know, you know what? I really wonder if Barnabas didn't say, man, I'd have been a fly on the wall during this conversation. Do you remember when Paul was converted in Acts chapter 9 and no one believed him? Who was the brother that took Paul and went to the Jerusalem elders and said, Brothers, you need to accept him. This is genuine. Who pleaded Paul's case? Who was on Paul's side? It was this great man named Barnabas. His name means son of encouragement. Who was it that when the brothers had need in the early church in Acts chapter 4, at the end of the chapter, who stepped up first and sold property to meet those needs? It was Barnabas. You're talking about a good man. Barnabas was as good as they came. You didn't get any better than Barnabas. He was an encourager. He would fight for you. He was loyal. And now his relationship with Paul is on the line. And what does he do? He decides it's a hill to die on. And they part ways. What should have happened? In my opinion, in my very humble estimation, Barnabas was not an apostle. He is referenced as an apostle um, in the first missionary journey, but commentators believe that's a reference as an apostle as being sent out by the church. He was not qualified as an apostle as he has seen the Lord Jesus the way that Paul and the other apostles were. So what's the point? The point is Paul outranked him. Paul was the authority. Paul was the leader. In my opinion, what Barnabas should have said is, look, Paul, this is very important to me. I ask you to pray about this. I, let's seek the Lord together. And I cannot stress how important it is to me that John Mark join us. But listen, I'm going to submit to your authority. And we'll do what you deem best. That's what he should have done. God always, always, always honors authority. Amen? Always. And Barnabas, I feel Made a mistake. Now, let me tell you two reasons why I feel like Barnabas made the mistake. Now, am I saying it in a judgy way? Am I throwing stones? No, because John Mark went on to do amazing things for God. John Mark went on to become a champion of the faith. And he penned the gospel of Mark. So I'm not, I'm not being, you know, haughty saying, look, throw stones at him. I'm just saying what would have caused this disagreement to not have been so sharp? Two things that I notice. Number one, Barnabas is never mentioned again in the New Testament. Now, did Barnabas go on and fulfill his mission? I'm sure he did. Did Barnabas go on and serve the Lord in a great way? Oh, I'm sure that he did. But when it comes to the pages of Acts, he's nowhere else mentioned. He falls off right here. I think that's telling. Number two, now this is very interesting. Watch what happens. What do we say? Paul was the authority and he should have listened. He should have submitted to that. But listen to this. Verse number 31. 
Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark. Verse number 38, but Paul thought best not to take him since he had withdrawn in Pamphylia. And then verse 39, there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. Remember, he's from Cyprus. He's going to go and strengthen the churches there in his own country. But watch what happens when Paul and Silas leave. Look at the difference. Verse 40. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been, look at that, commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. He was sent out. Do you see the difference between Barnabas and Paul here? Lord, forgive me if I'm reading too much into the text. I don't mean to do that. But do you know what it almost sounds like to me? It almost sounds like Barnabas got sideways and had that attitude, I'm going to take my ball and I'm going to go home. He was not commended by the brothers. They were not sent out the way they should have been. See, when things are done right, and things are, even, even if there's some tension, even if there's some disagreement, when things are done right, the leadership should be able to bless you. You see what I'm saying? And that happened with Paul and Silas. It did not happen with Barnabas and John Mark. Did they go on and do good things? Yes, yes, yes. Did God bring reconciliation? Praise God, yes. But I can't imagine how damaged the tender soul of Barnabas was being the encourager he was, being the leader he was, being the man of God he was, there was a lot of collateral damage that happened right here. So what's the point today? The point is, number one, disagreements happen among godly people. Just because you love the Lord and just because the church is under the lordship of Jesus doesn't mean that we won't sharply disagree at times. Things will happen. Feelings will get hurt. But do you know how you keep your feelings from getting hurt? Let's just say Bob comes up to me after church and he says, Chad, first of all, I didn't like the way you held that microphone. Second, I didn't like half of what you said. Third, I really don't like the shoes you're wearing today. And fourthly, or thirdly, whatever one I'm on, I just, I just don't like the way you're running things around here. Now, see, anyone, anyone could tell me that, and it would hurt my pride, and it would hurt. But see, Bob's different. How many of you know this? The people you love the most can hurt you the worst. Their words weigh more, don't they? Their words sting more. And Satan will know how to use people you love. He knows how to influence. He knows how to disrupt he knows how to cause division. He's a master at it. Now see, anyone else in the church, a first time visitor can come up and say, wasn't too impressed with your sermon. And I'd say, well, there's 1,500 churches in the city. Try another one. Don't matter to me. A long time attender could come up to me and say, listen, I didn't agree with your sermon. And you know what I'd say? Talk to my boss. Ask the Lord about it. Pray about it. It don't matter to me. I'll say what God tells me to say. But if Bob comes up to me, says, Chad, I didn't like it. It's going to be a different wound than if anybody else does it. You understand what I'm saying? Paul and Barnabas, they were, they were teammates. They were co-laborers. They were friends. They did, they did ministry together. They did life together. I mean, they were in it together. I can imagine how deeply both of them were hurt by this. Let me tell you, Satan will know how to cause hurt. But how, how, how do you stop? How do you stop from not being hurt? Let me tell you two quick ways, okay? Let me tell you one way that God's teaching me. I just had, I just had a family that just, oof, boy, wounded me deeply. I love them, and I'm praying, and oh, I'm interceding. But you're talking about hurt. Oh. But what's sparing me? Two things. Two things, okay? And you need to write this down. Number one, put on the full armor of God. You know what protects your heart and all of your vital organs? 
the breastplate of righteousness. Amen. I'm reading a book right now called Dress to Kill. (laughs) It's about wearing the armor of God. And I'm consciously putting on the armor of God every day. Let me tell you what else will spare your feelings. It's when you do what Paul said in Galatians. I'm crucified with Christ. You know, it's hard to hurt a dead man. And you know, when I'm dead in sin and I'm dead into Christ, I'm crucified to Christ, I'm alive into Christ, but this flesh, this, this, my pride, my ego, my arrogance, my incredible need to feel like I'm right, my need for everyone to agree with me, my need for everyone to like me, my need for everyone to give me a pat on the back, when that dies... When that's crucified with Christ, then how can you be hurt? Make sense? How do you handle these disagreements? Well, you crucify yourself to Christ. And you won't get as hurt. And you put on the armor of God and that protects all those... It protects your heart. Protects your vital organs. And what do you do? This is the most important. You don't quit. You keep going. You keep going. Barnabas sailed to Cyprus. Oh, he sailed away hurt. He sailed away wounded. But he kept going in Jesus' name. Paul sailed north to Galatia. He went away hurt. He went away wounded. But he still did it. And what happened over time? God in his beautiful grace brought reconciliation and brought restoration. Thank God that happens. But if you're someone today that you have been hurt in the past, then I want to encourage you. Handle it the way the early church did. Number one, talk about it. Deal with it. Somebody offended you, go to them. Say, brother, you probably don't even know this, but you've offended me. And I want to talk to you about it. Can you imagine how much humility that takes to walk up to somebody? Glenn, you don't know this, Glenn, but you offended me. You probably aren't even aware of it, but I, I was offended by this. Prideful people won't do that. But that's the biblical way to do it. You've been hurt. You've been offended in the past. You've been dealt a blow in the past. Well, put on the armor of God. Be crucified unto Christ. Determine you won't quit. You're still going to go on in Jesus' name. And let me tell you, God will heal the wounds. Over time, God will heal. He'll have grace for that. He'll help you. And, and, and let me tell you, you're not gonna, you, you, you be a pe- people pleaser, you're, never gonna, you're not going to make it far. You can't be a people pleaser. Amen? People will quit on you. They'll talk about you. They'll lie about you. They'll do, it. They'll do everything underneath the sun. But that don't change the mission. What if John Mark had a sulked around for the rest of his life and said, Paul don't like me. Paul has no confidence in me. Paul don't think I'm a good missionary. He could have done that. And the kingdom could have suffered. The kingdom could have been hurt. But no, what did all three of these men do? They went on in Jesus' name. And then restoration came. You need to move on. That divorce, you need to move on. That job loss, that boss that fired you, you need to move on. That bankruptcy, you need to move on. All of the hurts, all of the disappointments you've had that you've held. Listen, you need to move on. And say, listen, it is what it is. God will give me grace. I'm going forward in Jesus' name. Amen. As Michael comes, let's pray together today. I don't know where you are in the sense of feeling slighted or feeling hurt or feeling offended. But I'll tell you this. If you have a pulse today, if you have a heartbeat today, You better believe Satan will try to get your feelings hurt. He'll try to get you offended. He'll try everything. Look at Paul and Barnabas. He came at them with persecution and they overcame. He came at them with opposition and they overcame. He came at them with pride. You remember that a couple of weeks ago? They tried to worship them as gods and they overcame. But what's the one thing they could not overcome? A personal hurt. Isn't that unbelievable? 
They overcame cities persecuting them. They overcame a stoning. They overcame these magicians. They overcame so many obstacles. But the one thing they couldn't overcome was a personal hurt. Are you the same way? It's the one stumble in your life. It's the one thing that's tripping you up. Put on the armor of God. Amen. Put on the armor. Toughen up. End your hardness as a good soldier. And say, God, this is not going to be the stumbling block in my life. Yes, I'm hurt. Listen, Barnabas had to have been hurt. Paul had to have been hurt. I'm not saying the hurt's not real. But I'm saying have a resolve. I'm going to move past it. This family that's hurt me so deeply. What have I had to do? I've had to say, Lord, I give them. Lord, they're yours. They're not mine. They're yours. They're your sheep. You do with them whatever you want. You want coaches call it next man up football. All right, God, it's next man up. Let's go. Let's go. We're on mission. We're on target. We're not going to sulk. We're not going to sit here and cry about that. We're not going to. No, we're going to put on the armor of God. And when arrows hit us, they hit us and we go on. We go forward. You want know Roman soldiers did with the shield of faith. I'm reading this book right now and it's blowing my mind. You know what they did with the shield of faith? Their shields were the size of doors and they had hinges on them. And you know what? When they went into battle, Brian, if you were beside me, Georgiana, if you were beside him, John, if you were beside me, Bob, you know what they would do? They would link their shields in the hinges and they would march in unison. Can you imagine what that army, when they saw thousands of Roman soldiers linked, marching in unison, advancing? But see, you get Georgiana off here by herself. You get John over here by himself. You get Brian over here off to himself. And what happens? Then the enemy can just attack and attack and attack. And he can beat you down. But we lock our shields of faith together. We march in unison saying, no, we're going to accomplish the will of God. The glory of God is number one in my life. And we're going to get it done. We're going to get it done. There'll be casualties. There'll be people fall by the wayside. There'll be people join other ministries. They'll go to other churches. They'll do all kinds of different things. But we are going to accomplish the will of God. No matter what. There's a resolve. Don't quit. That's what this whole thing's about. Don't quit. Stay on mission. Let's bow our heads today. God, give us strength today. Strength to go on. Strength to continue. Strength to not back down. Strength to not give up. Lord, you know, you know how Satan has fought me lately this week, God. I was just thinking of the irony. It seems like the harder I pray, the harder Satan fights. And right there, Satan is saying, quit praying. Quit. Why don't you just discontinue Tuesday prayer? Why don't you just quit? Why don't you just quit it? Because you know what's happening. The harder you press in, the harder you get attacked. So just give it up and quit. Oh, what a liar. 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 Lord, what is Satan lying in these people's lives? What's he saying that's not true? What's he saying that's a lie? Lord, let your truth be in us. Let your truth be in us. Let your truth be in us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So strengthen us, Lord. Strengthen us. Strengthen us. In Jesus' name. (laughs) In Jesus' name. Amen.